as um, people fly, file in the room. Uh, but very quickly, I just want to welcome everybody back to the Dharma Doors. As usual, I'm MC Owens. You're in the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And tonight on the Dharma Doors, we're starting a new sutra. Um, we're going to open a new Dharma door. Uh, so that should be fun. Um, so um, the sutra we're doing is called the Sri Maladeva Simhananda, Simhanada Sutra. Um, I, I'm going to have a lot to say about the title of this sutra. Uh, in fact, I just want to give you a warning, so to speak, that this, this evening's class it's going to be a little, um, well, it might seem like it's going to be a little academic in that way because we're going to talk history. But as usual, I'm going to try to spice things up a little bit, you know, make it interesting in that way. But I'm also the kind of person that finds uh, history fascinating in that way. Um, and so even though uh, we we might take a peek at the at the actual sutra. We're going to probably read a little bit of it uh, this evening. But if you came for the big heavy dharma ideas, you're going to maybe have to wait till next week for the big heavy dharma ideas. But I actually think there's a lot of dharma in thinking about history, um, and not just Buddhist history, but just thinking about the past thinking about what would be called epistemology, which is this idea of how do we know what we know? How do we know anything in that sense? Well, we, we know a lot from history. And in particular, what I want to talk about tonight is where, where this sutra comes from, like at all. Like how, how have we in the year 2021, <laughs> via the internet, how is it that we have come to talk about the sutra? Um, and so I'm going to do something tonight, which I haven't really done in the Dharma doors. I definitely haven't done it lately, if I've done it ever, which is I want to talk a little bit about uh, where all these sutras come from. How, do, how Where do all these Buddhist texts come from? And I don't necessarily mean from the Buddha, I mean, how is it that we in English have them, you know, how did this all come about? Um, and interestingly, like, as I kind of lay this out for you this evening, um, part of what's exciting about this way of thinking for me is that all of a sudden, the year 1000 doesn't seem too far away in the grand scheme of things. And then the year 400 AD, we're going to spend a lot of time around the year 400, 420, you know, fifth century. We're going to spend a little bit of time in that area tonight. And it's very related to how it is that we got here talking about this tonight. Um, so, yeah, so we're going to do a little bit of talking about that. And so I guess that's a long introduction to say before we dive into this actual sutra, we're going to talk sources. What are the what are our sources? So I guess I'm going to maybe, although I hadn't planned to do it this way, I'm actually thinking I'm going to work uh, backwards a little bit. And what I mean is, is that uh, Noam has put in the chat a link to a PDF version of the sutra, or at least one English translation of the sutra, um, and it's going to be probably. Uh, the one that uh, is the link is a translation by um, a woman named Diana Paul. And I'm going to mainly be using her translation. I am, as usual, working on my own uh, translation. And I will share with you, of course, as this goes along, I'll share with you divergences in the translation, why I would ch choose to translate things differently. Um, but the translation that is in the chat that you have a PDF of is a PDF of this book. So this is a book by the Numata Center. What's it called? The Numata Center for Buddhist Translation and Research. They are presently, like as we speak, in the process 
of compiling and creating an English tripitaka. And a tripitaka, of course, is the name for the entire collection of Buddhist writings. The sutras, the Vinaya, the Abhidharma, commentaries, biographies, hagiographies, all this stuff that's related to the world of Buddhism. There, and they're a committee, they're a team of, of scholars working with scholars all over the world to compile English version, versions of all the sutras. The translation in here is of two sutras, actually. One is our Queen Srimala, or the lion's roar of Queen Srimala. And also in this, in the PDF you have, and if you have this book, there's also a new English translation of the Vimalakirti Sutra um, by John McRae. And John McRae is no joke. So this is a, um, you know, a great resource. I'm not going to talk, uh, I might have a little bit to say about Vimalakirti down the line, but in general, I just want to say that this came out in, I think, 1994. Well, it was published in 2004, but I believe the, you know, these things get tricky. Well, let's just go with publication date. So this is from 2004, okay? So already that was a, a little while ago, but the version that's in here, the English version of the sutra that was translated from Chinese by Diana Paul first appeared in this book called Women in Buddhism, Images of the Feminine in the Mahayana Tradition. This is Diana Paul's uh, book or one of her books. And in here, she takes excerpts from a bunch of different sutras that all have to do with images of the feminine in Mahayana Buddhism. In here, I believe it's even the last chapter. Yeah, it's actually, she saves the best for last. The very last chapter of this book is a partial translation of the lion's roar of Queen Srimala. I think it's partial. I don't think it's the whole thing. Uh, I'm, yeah, it's a partial. She takes excerpts. But what you should know is that the work in here was part of, I believe, part of her uh, PhD dissertation. I forget where she went. And so even though this was published in, where are we at? This was first published in 1979. Now we're even further back. But the work that she did for this was, again, part of our dissertation. So even though it was published in 79, she was probably doing this translation a number of years before this. From all everything that I can see, the translation that's in here, the 2004 edition, is identical with the version, or at least the excerpts that are in this version. So that means even though this was published in 2004, the work, the translation goes back decades. And I say that because when I read this translation, it definitely reads like a translation from the 70s. And that's not a, a, a knock, that's not putting it down, but Buddhist studies, the world of Buddhism in America has come a long way since 1970. So a lot of the ideas of Buddhism, in particular Mahayana Buddhism, have been much better understood now. And so that's kind of maybe one reason alone to start working on a new translation. So point those out. Now, there is another English translation of this, which is in our classic Maharatna Kuta Sutra collection. So this is what I read from most Sunday nights. This is a partial translation of this pile of jewels or the mound of jewels, the peak of jewels, the Ratna Kuta. So the Ratna Kuta is a collection of 49 sutras that have been compiled together as an anthology and the lion's roar of Queen Srimala is number 48, okay? This translation was done in the, also in the 80s, I think. 
pretty sure this was published in the 80s. But again, the work goes back, where are you at? 1983, but I know that the work that this translation committee did goes back quite a bit. And so again, we're back in the 70s, if we're gonna use this translation. There's one more English translation to deal with, and that's the first English translation. So there's this book called The Lion's Roar of Queen Srimala, which was translated by uh, Alex and Hideko Wayman. We uh, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce their last name. I believe they were, were a husband-wife team, uh, translator team, where they did this translation together. This was translated in 1962 or at least the bulk of the work goes back to the 60s. And so in 1962, there was not an English translation of the sutra yet. This translation, however, is an interesting specimen. <laughs> this is an interesting case because what Alex and Hideko uh, Wayman did was they actually used the uh, a version of this that's in Tibetan, which I'll talk about in a minute when we get to non-English sources, but they used a Tibetan version, two Chinese versions, which I'll talk about also, and they referred to these lengthy quotes in other Sanskrit Buddhist texts. And that actually right there gives you the entire range of the available sources for this sutra. There's two Chinese versions, which I'm gonna go in depth in in a minute. There's one Tibetan version and primarily through this Buddhist uh, um, uh, bodhisattva commentator named Shantideva, Shantideva has these giant quotes from this sutra, and that's all in Sanskrit. So there's not an entire Sanskrit version of this sutra. There are these big quotes, though, which are very, very helpful for imagining and even in certain cases knowing what the original Sanskrit version of this sutra may have read like. Okay. So we're moving backwards now. So the Sanskrit quotes, those lengthy Sanskrit quotes, those probably come from an early medieval period, probably 800, 900, up to the year 1000. It depends on the source that you're talking about. And again, those are just quotes. So we can kind of put those aside. Then we'll go back to an earlier version of this, which is in the Tibetan language. So I don't do, I don't work with Tibetan. I have never studied the Tibetan language. Um, and so I don't use it as a primary source. And I also don't include it usually in my talks because I don't usually try. I try not to talk about that, which I don't know much about. What you should know though is, is that there is a tripitaka, a, a canon, a collection of all the Buddhist writings that is preserved in the Tibetan language. And this is what would be called the Kangur, K-A-N-G-Y-U-R, Tibetan Tripitaka. That's a particular um, version of the entire Tibetan Buddhist canon. And I believe if you even want to look at that, you have to go to the Peking University in China where they have it in the library. And from what I understand, it's not easy to go see. Um, there are other versions of it, but that's sort of considered the primary source. So the Tibetan is also probably from around roughly the year 1000, give or take. That, that particular... Tripitaka, the Tibetan Buddhist canon, is a it's a tricky um, it's a tricky thing to understand and pinpoint the date of. 
um, there's basically what I'm getting at is there's a lot of research that still needs to go into studying that canon. Um, so there you have it. Um, again, the Waymans used a, they even talk about it in their, in their introduction, but they actually were relying upon a photocopy of a photocopy from the Peking Library of this for the Tibetan. Okay, so now we can start getting back to the oldest known sources for this sutra. So, um, yeah, now I'm going to go all the way back to the early, the earliest historical reference to this sutra anywhere ever. The earliest historical reference to this sutra was when a Buddhist monk from central India who came by way of central China, by way of what would be called the Silk Road, stopped off in a desert oasis named Dunhuang for a while. And then this Indian Buddhist monk named Dharma Kashema came to China, came to the capital of China, and he famously translated a number of Buddhist texts. There is a record that he translated in the year, well, we're not exactly sure, but he died in the year 433 AD. So sometime before the year 433 AD, this was probably 420 is the common date given to Dharma Kashema's translation activity. So we'll call it 420 is the date when he supposedly, and we don't really have any reason to de deny this, this was when Dharma Kashema showed up and he said, oh, you, you guys don't know about the Srimala Deva Sutra? Well, let me translate it for you. And so he produced the very first Chinese translation. And again, this is the oldest record ever. Now, 420, 433 AD is a long time ago. It's only a long time ago. And so just the fact that we have that record is, is significant. All right. Um, I'll have more to say about where this sutra may have actually come from before Dharma Kashema tr translated it. But now we go back, we fast forward to the year 435 AD. So just a little bit after Dharma Kashema passed away, a new person, a new Indian Buddhist monk shows up in China or what is today called China. And this is a Buddhist translator monk from, he was from Magadha. He was from the land of the Buddha. And he actually didn't go, he didn't go north through the Silk Road, through the Gobi Desert into China. He actually traveled by sea, by boat to China, the, the, the Southern route. And so he shows up in China in the 430s and he produces the oldest known translation of this sutra. So I happen to have, let's see, this is Guna Bhadra's. So this is uh, just off of the internet, but this is an example that I'm using. This is the oldest known version of this sutra. It's in Chinese, translated by this guy, Guna Bhadra, in the year 435. Noam, did you have a question? Yeah, so, so the other Chinese translation, we have record of it, but we don't have it. We, the text is lost, the text but is lost. we have records that he did it, okay. and we have other Dharma Kashema translations. So everybody's pretty certain he did one, and we just lost it. Can I ask about another thing that maybe you're going to yeah. get to, which is where the, the, uh, the Tibetan version and the and the Sanskrit quotes, they have, which happened much later, the Tibetan version was translated from the Sanskrit? Yes. And the Sanskrit quotes, it, are we to understand that at that time there was still a Sanskrit version of it that then was lost afterwards? Yes. Okay. So every Dharma Kashema, Guna Bhajra, everybody is saying, oh yeah, there's a Sanskrit version. Got it. 
And one of the things, if you don't know, one of the things about the, the Tibetan Buddhist Tripitaka, the Kangyur collection, the Kangyur Buddhist Tripitaka, the Tibetan language is much, much, much closer to Sanskrit or that, yeah, much closer to Sanskrit than Chinese is. So actually the entire Tibetan canon, the entire Tibetan Tripitaka is really, really helpful because every single one of those sutras was basically translated verbatim from the Sanskrit. Now, without going into the long history of Buddhism in India and the decline of Buddhism in India, we have very few original Sanskrit records of all of these sutras. There's actually only a handful that we have complete Sanskrit originals from India. And that's because India, you know, again, Buddhism died out and eventually they moved on. And so they did not preserve all of these Buddhist texts. Fortunately, the Tibetans did. And then again, fortunately, some of these later Sanskrit commentators quoted a bunch of stuff in their writings. And so we can refer to those. Yep. Okay. So let, well, we only have one more to talk about. So th that was a back in 435. Fast forward about 300 years. So in the year 727 AD, another Indian Buddhist monk comes to China. I believe he came by the Silk Road. His name was Bodhi, Bodhi Ruchi. And there's actually two Bodhi Ruchis in history, in Buddhist history. One's very famous. One is not very well known. This is actually the not very well known one. So this Buddhist monk from India shows up and he does a lot of translating, but one thing this Bodhiruchi guy, this Bodhiruchi monk is very famous for doing is translating the Maharatnakuta Sutra collection, the whole collection of the pile of jewels. Now, the thing about the Maharatnakuta collection is of the 49 sutras that make up the pile of jewels, many of them um, existed just independently as their own sutra, um, popular with a little micro tradition. You might call it a sect, but there was a, a lot of these sutras that were just floating around. This one, the lion's roar of Queen Srimala was one of those. It had been floating around since 435, if not way before that. But Bodhiruchi shows up to China and he says, oh, you, you guys don't have the, the pile of jewels. You don't have the Ratnakuta collection. And he's like, oh, but you do though. Cause you have this one over here that was translated by like Kumara Jiva. You have this one over here that was translated by so-and-so. You have this one, uh, but that's a terrible translation. Let me, Bodhiruchi, do a new translation of it. So what Bodhiruchi did is that he famously compiled from existing translations or just doing it himself, he kind of compiled this new version or it's not a new version, it was the first version in Chinese of the entire 49 sutra collection of the Ratnakuta. So, everybody okay with all those dates? Okay, so in addition, I want to tell you about one more, well, actually there's a few more source uh, things I want to tell you about. The first thing is we also have uh, regarding this particular sutra, the, the sutra we're starting tonight, we also have a lot of commentaries. This sutra was seemingly at one time very, very popular. Some, like, it seems to have been very popular in the 400s, the 500s, 
by the time Bodorucci is doing a new translation of this in the year 727, it actually seems to have died out a little bit. So even by then, it was kind of old news. But around the year, again, 400s, 500s, it was the sutra. And one, there's one commentary in particular that I'm going to mention. And once we start diving into the sutra, I'm probably going to refer to it more. And that is, there's a very, very famous commentary on this sutra that is attributed to the, a, a prince of Japan named Shotoku. So there, this, and this was in the year, or at least this particular commentary was written in the year 630, sorry, 622. So 622 is kind of right when this sutra was kind of very popular. It went to Japan where it was very popular. And I don't, I wish I could actually spend a lot more time talking about Prince Shotoku because he's really important to the history of Buddhism. He's, he is, he is Japanese Buddhist history. Like if there wasn't Prince Shotoku, you know, there might not even be Japanese Buddhism in that way. He's so important. So this was a, um, I'm not the emperor of Japan. Actually, at that time, Japan was not a unified country, I believe. But one of the major provinces, the prince of that province, this guy Shotoku, was a major supporter of Buddhism. And he commissioned all of these Chinese monks to come to Japan. He commissioned for translations to happen. And he's even given the credit of writing these commentaries on the Lotus Sutra, the Vimalakirti Sutra, and Queen Srimala Sutra. So that alone, like if you know the Lotus Sutra and you know the Vimalakirti Sutra, the fact that this is the third sutra that Shotoku commented on is, it speaks to how significant this sutra was at a certain time, that it was up there with the Lotus Sutra and Vimalakirti. Right. So I definitely wanted you to know about that. And that also kind of, again, the year 622, it speaks to how popular this sutra was in Japan, in China, Central Asia, even still in India. So this sutra is all over the Buddhist world. And let's talk about, let's go back a little bit further. Let's uh, maybe try to identify where this sutra actually comes from. So if you read, and I would probably suggest it, it's, if you really get into this sutra, the, uh, the, the Waymans, Alex and Hideko, they have a, a great introduction to this sutra. Uh, it's very rigorous. It's, you know, it's very well done. And they, through a, a variety of scholarly, um, uh, through a bunch of scholarly research, they trace the origin of this sutra to a large group of Buddhists that were popular all over India, north to south, called the Mahasamgikas. So I did a, um, a talk, a visual presentation for the San Francisco Dharma Collective. I forget what the name of that talk was called, which will be really helpful for you to find it. Uh, but it was about the history of the spread of Buddhism and the origin of these different uh, sects and schools of Buddhism and where they were. And in that talk, I mentioned the Mahasamgikas. And for the most part, this group, and by the way, their name, the Mahasamgikas, the name means the great Sangha. And this group, the, the Mahasamgikas, are basically considered the, the beginning of Mahayana Buddhism. So the Mahasamgikas are kind of a, they're not an early, early Buddhist school, 
but they're not full on Mahayana Buddhism. They're kind of this uh, transitional period. The most important thing about the Mahasamgikas is that they, among, among many things, they seem to have considered the Sangha to be both lay people and monastics. And that's important because in some of the other Hinayana schools, some of the more conservative, ultra monastic, more patriarchal schools, only the monks were kind of considered the Sangha and the lay people supported the Sangha, meaning they supported the monks and the nuns, but they themselves were kind of outside of the Sangha. The Mahasamgikas, again, are interesting because they considered everybody a part of the, the Sangha. They also have a pretty famous um, uh, origin story of the Buddha. It's a very mythological biography of the Buddha that make, definitely is very Mahayana sounding, where the Buddha does not sound like he was just an Indian prince that that got you know uh, disillusioned with life, and then it's like much more cosmic than that. So it's kind of er, again early Mahayana, and so these the, the Waymans they through again a bunch of like literary things they trace this sutra as one of the Mahasamgika sutras, uh, uh, among many others. And again, the Mahasamgika seem to be the origin of a lot of these sutras, a lot of these Mahayana sutras. Okay, um, let me, I have one, I have one more thing to say about sources. And it's something I haven't really probably ever mentioned. It's really important that I mention it and I get asked this a lot. So here we go. There's a very important tripitaka there's a very important uh, Buddhist canon that exists in the world. It's called the, it's a Japanese canon called the Taisho Shinshu Daizokyo. <laughs> but it's really just usually called the Taisho, T-A-I-S-H-O, the Taisho or the Taisho canon. So this was, this is a, a canon, a tripitaka of all the Buddhist writings, all the sutras, all the Vinaya, all the Abhidharma, all the commentaries, all the everything. It was compiled by a large team of Japanese scholars all throughout the 1920s. And I think the, it first was published in 1930 or somewhere around there. This is, um, it's very, very important because what it is, is even though it's Japanese by Japanese scholars from Japan, the contents of it are what would be called uh, Chinese. Again, all these words are modern, modern words, right? So China, Chinese, Japanese, like none of these words existed until <laughs> before a few years ago, frankly. But I use them because you'll know what I'm talking about. So you may know, of course, that the Japanese use a character-based language. The characters are called kanji. And they're the same as what are in Chinese called hanza, han characters. So the languages are very similar, especially when you get into medieval Japanese, it's even closer to Chinese or medieval Chinese. So what this team of Japanese scholars did is amazing because what they did is they used every available text, whether it was in Sanskrit, Tibetan, bunch of bunch of bunch of different Chinese versions, manuscripts, all kinds of stuff. And what they did is, is they went through and compiled in a, an official version of every sutra, every commentary, every, every piece of the Vinaya, everything. 
And so it's this Taisho Shinshu Daizokyo that scholars throughout the world use to reference Buddhist texts. It's what I use. It's what these, uh, these printouts are from the Taisho. Um, these are actually, just because I'm trying to be really thorough tonight, these are actually from a, it might even be Taiwanese. It's either Taiwanese or Chinese, I'm not sure, but it's an online digital version of the Taisho Shinshu Daizokyo, and it's called C-Beta, uh, and that's an acronym, C-B-E-T-A. So that's where all these come from, are C-Beta, which is a digitization of the Taisho. If you were to go to a very good university, pretty much anywhere, they might have a Taisho Shinshu Daizokyo in the library. It's about a hundred volumes. The volumes are very thick. They are very big books, Bible thin pages and characters, Chinese characters, you practically need like a magnifying glass to read them. So it's a hundred volumes, but it's, it's dense. And, and I actually think there's more than a hundred volumes now. So anyways, that's the modern source for studying Buddhism. Pretty much, you know, regardless of whether you're studying Indian Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, Japanese Buddhism, that is the source. The thing that makes that Tripitaka, the Taisho, the thing that makes it so unique is that of all these Tripitakas that have been throughout history, like I mentioned the Tibetan one, the, the Kangyur Tripitaka, all these different collections of Buddhist writings, they have all come from a specific sect of Buddhism. And what happens is, is that then that school or that sect's their doctrine, their interpretation of Buddhism kind of affects how they order things, how they translate things, and how they compile things. So whenever you read things from the past, you have to kind of be on your guard, like, who, who did this? And why did they do that? And who did they do it for? And who was fitting the bill? Always an important question to ask when it comes to these things. The Taisho Shinshu Daizokyo, this Japanese Tripitaka, it's fascinating because it's probably the world's first Tripitaka that isn't sectarian. Now, if you want to consider academia a sect, I'm with you, and we would have to know that's the sect, that's the agenda, that's who is fitting the bill. So we would keep all those things in mind, but the fact that they were kind of going for this really, truly objective version of all these sutras that people could really rely on. Very, very important. So, okay, that concludes the sources section of where this thing comes from. Questions, answers, ideas about that? Yeah, Tanya. Um, so do you have the Tripitaka version? So the Tripitaka is just a word for the Buddhist canon. Right, but do you, do you have the Tripitaka version, the Toshi, to, uh, Taisho Tripitaka? The Taisho Tripitaka, tri, 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 oh, yes. you, yeah, you were showing it, okay. Yep. Sorry, I missed that. And what's, what's beautiful about the Taisho is that it will have both the Gunabhadra and the Bodhiruchi versions, because they were trying to amass all of them, so. Um, uh, Michael, yeah, I was just going to ask that. Can you clarify? At first, I was thinking they sort of found every version of a sutra and then made an amalgamation or sort of an average of them or something. But no, they they compiled all of the versions. Both. Both. Because wow. so they got every version of the Gunabhadra translation. And anywhere there were discrepancies, they would have a meeting and they would sit for hours and debate about, you know, and then they would make like, well, three versions have this character, 
and only one version has that character. So we're gonna go with this one, but we're gonna put a footnote that lets you know in, yeah, it's completely very, very thorough. <laughs> Okay, so that finally brings us to the Sri Mala Deva Simhanada Sutra. So that would be the Sanskrit title. We do have Sanskrit records of the sutra existing, like I said, from quotes. So we know this is the title of it, but it actually has a few different titles. Mainly, though, what happens is, and this always happens, these titles either get expanded or they get reduced. And what I mean is, is that this is the, st this is the standard way it's called. And let's go through this really quickly. So Sri Mala Devi is a person. This is my rendition of Sri Mala Devi. The Shri means beautiful, wonderful. A mala is actually, you might know about a mala, like a mala. But even though these days a mala is um, like a beaded necklace, what a mala more, it, it is a necklace. So it's more about the necklace than it is about the beads and counting and counting mantras. So it's actually about the necklace and a mala, at least at the time of the Buddha or the time that this sutra was written, a mala was actually like a, um, a, a flower garland that you would wear uh, like a crown. You might also wear it as a necklace or you might wear it as a bracelet or an anklet. So those are the connotations of the mala that it's a flower wreath necklace or crown in that way. And because this is Sri, the beautiful Mala Devi, this is the queen aspect of the word. So this is Queen Sri Mala. Her name is just Sri Mala, but it means this beautiful Mala this beautiful flower crown or something like that. Um, I'll tell you more about her name when we take a peek at the sutra real quick. But so this is our hero. This is our uh, star of the show. And then this is the Simha Nada Sutra. And Simha Nada, if you're, you might know Simha means a lion. Simhanada is the lion's roar. So this is the lion's roar of Queen Srimala, the Sri Mala Devi Simhanada Sutra. That's the title that it is known by. Um, eventually it'll just get reduced to the Sri Mala Sutra. Simple, Sri Mala Sutra. But that it happens much later when everybody already knows this sutra very well. They already know it's about the lion's roar. They already know all that. They already know she's a queen. So it just becomes just like the Vimalakirti Sutra. It just becomes, even though it has a longer name, these things get reduced to just the Sri Mala Deva or just Sri Mala Sutra. The version that I'm going to be reading from which is, again, I'm not going to read the, the, the Waymans, because that's a very, very old, very dated translation. Uh, I'm going to read the Diana Paul version. The Diana Paul translation is from, she translated the, I believe she translated the Gunabhadra one, which is... So if you remember from my long introduction, Gunabhadra was the oldest existing one. Not that older one that we know about that doesn't exist, of course, but the one that we know about. So she translates from that one. And after reading both of them, um, the Gunabhadra one, the Chinese is, is much easier. And it's not 
it's not about it being easy so much as um th this the gunabhadra one the earlier one that she translates that i'm working on it's much clearer much you know and this happens in chinese when there's already a popular translation of a sutra and then somebody else shows up to do a translation of it like Bodhiruchi did in the 700s it happens a lot that the later translation they know they're not going to make a better version than the one that's been popular for so long so what they wind up doing is is doing these very technical translations that help you read the more popular one but if you just try to read it on your like on its own it can be a little clunky so just want you to know that um but in the ratnakuta collection in this one which it doesn't help that they uh put it as sutra number 19 even though it's sutra 48 and all that they translate that bodhiruchi version so just so that you know if you notice any differences it's because this is a different version so gunabhadra our friend um there's a few important things about the gunabhadra version that we're going to be reading for the next few weeks the one is that he has a very long title of the sutra which i want to tell you about two the the Gunabhadra version, the version we're working on, it has what are the very famous 15 chapter divisions. So this sutra is kind of sort of like the, uh, the way the Vajra Sutra, the Diamond Sutra is famously divided into 32 chapters. And those 32 chapters have significance. The number 32 has significance. Similarly, this sutra is divided into these 15 chapters, and people make a big deal about these divisions. And so it's another reason why I wanted to work uh, with all of us on the Gunabhadra edition. Um, and each of those chapters have titles that kind of describe what the chapter is about. So it's almost a kind of form of mini commentary in that way so with that being said let me tell you about gunabhadra's big long title so he calls it if i can find it i have this terrible tendency of just throwing things when i'd like i won't use that again um so he calls this the um well in sanskrit it would be the srimala simhananda simhanada ekyayana maha upaya vaipulya sutra which would be the srimala lion's roar so the lion's roar of queen srimala the Ekyayana, the single vehicle. So if you were familiar with like Mahayana, Hinayana, there's also the idea of the Ekyayana, the single vehicle. So the Srimala, Simhanada, Ekyayana, Maha Upaya, the great Upaya, the great expedient means, Vaipulya Sutra. So the word vaipulya is, is significant. It means broad. It means broad. But you need to know a little something to catch that, what it, what it really is pointing at. So there's a, a, um, a rubric or a kind of a structure that's used in Mahayana Buddhism to talk about how, 
how did the Buddha teach all 84,000 of these different sutras? How, like, and, and frankly, when I read the Lotus Sutra, it's very different than when I read the Satipatthana, the Four Foundations of Mindfulness Sutra. And that's very different from when I read the Heart Sutra. And that's very, so how does all this fit together? And so in the Mahayana tradition, they break the Buddha's 45 years of being an enlightened teacher they break it into these five periods. They say that he spent, I think it's about eight years. Each of these has, has certain numbers, by the way. Um, I'll try to remember them right, but it, I probably get it wrong. He spent this initial period teaching everybody four noble truths, four foundations of mindfulness, talked about nirvana, the basics. And then when everybody was ready, he introduced the Vipulya, the broad teachings like Vimalakirti, like uh, I think the Lotus, oh no, no, not the Lotus Sutra, hold on to the Lotus Sutra, um, like the Sri Maladevi Sutra, also a broad sutra, a Vipulya Sutra. Oh, that's what it was. That's why I was confused. So in this rubric, in this structure, the Buddha actually spent the initial 21 days as an enlightened teacher underneath the Bodhi tree, preaching the gigantic Avatamsaka Sutra. So that giant three volume sutra I often hold up, that's considered the first sutra that the Buddha taught to basically like anybody that could understand it because he was in this enlightened state under the Bodhi tree just preaching this Avatamsaka Sutra. Then when he realized that nobody got it, he, he backed it all up. And then he taught Four Noble Truths, Four Foundations of Mindfulness, all of that. Then he teaches this Vipulya, these Vipulya Sutras, talked about Upaya, all of that. Then he spent 22 years teaching the Pranya Paramita Sutras, which is the highest wisdom. In fact, he was getting everybody ready for these sutras. So that's the fourth period. And then the final period of the Buddha's teaching was when he taught the Lotus Sutra and the Parinirvana Sutra or the Maha Parinirvana Sutra, the last sutra. So those are the five periods of the Buddha's teachings. And so when this sutra, or at least when Gunabhadra calls this a Vipulya Sutra, a great Upaya Vipulya, and actually it's a great Upaya Vipulya Sutra about the single vehicle, that's actually placing this in a certain period of the Buddha's teaching. It's like, that's what that word kind of signifies. Okay. I think that covers all the titles. Talk about the lion's roar really quickly. So this sutra has, it's got a little narrative. It's not like the sutra we just did about Bajra the magician, where there was kind of a story going on. And of course, that is, you will find that in many sutras, especially the Mahayana sutras, where they're kind of like a story with a narrative and an arc. This is one of those ones that doesn't really have a narrative arc. It is sort of just, well, this lion's roar of Queen Srimala. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what it is. And if you're wondering, well, what is the lion's roar? So this is an idea that gets used in Buddhism a lot. There's kind of like really simple ways of explaining what it is, and then much more technical, complicated, almost mystical ways of talking about this. I want you to know that this is not a Mahayana Buddhist idea, the lion's roar. This is a, an idea that's pr prevalent throughout all of Buddhism. 
You see this a lot in the early Pali suttas when disciples of the Buddha, primarily Shariputra, a monk, an arhat like Shariputra, will teach other uh, people, teach other religious leaders, teach other religious adherents. He will teach them the Dharma. And to teach the Dharma in a fearless, eloquent way is considered the lion's roar. That's the simple explanation of it. So it's somebody who, it's somebody other than the Buddha in that way. Not to say that the Buddha didn't give the lion's roar, of course he did. But what I'm saying is, is that in the Pali suttas, you find it a lot where it says, and then Shariputra with the lion's roar taught the masses, da 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 da. And so it's kind of just a, a way of talking about teaching Buddhism, teaching the Dharma with a certain vigor and a certain eloquence. There's a little bit more to it as we lean towards that more technical, almost mystical aspect of the lion's roar. And mm, since this is a sutra about the lion's roar, I don't feel like I really should even get too into it because it's what the sutra is about. It's what, it's what we've come here to do is read the sutra and hear the lion's roar. But I just want you to know that even back in the early days when Shariputra was making the lion's roar, it has a lot to do with this teaching of emptiness slash and or dependent origination. In other words, it often seems that the lion's roar happens when the, the dialogue or the debate gets to that point where it's at this non-dual level of emptiness. And if you could really articulate that idea, that is truly eloquent. And not only that, it kind of, it, it's a showstopper. <laughs> In terms of argumentative debate, if you can, you know, again, eloquently drop the emptiness hammer, there's no answer. <laughs> it's done. And then that is the lion's roar. So this is going to be the lion's roar of Queen Srimala. That's it. It only took an hour to introduce it. Right? So I appreciate everybody um, uh, listening to that. I know it's not of interest to everybody, but I know it is of interest to many. So with that said, we're going to dive in to the sutra. So the first chapter here, and since I'm using the one that has titles, the title here is the, uh, if I were to, you know, try to, so this is what they call back translating. When you're really familiar with Chinese and you know how Chinese people translated Sanskrit ideas, you can kind of look at it and say, oh, this chapter was probably called in Sanskrit the Tathagata Tatha Tatha or Tathagata Bhutta Tathata Artha Punya. <laughs> probably. Otherwise, the merits of the Tathagatas. That's like not even really what it says. So right away, I'm amending Diana Paul's translation. Sorry, Diana. Um, but I would, yeah, she translates it as the merits of the Tathagata's true Dharma. Well, the word Dharma, the word true, I guess the word true, but this is really about the, the punya, the merit of the meaning, the artha, of the Tathagata's truth. But truth is this technical term of buta tathata. And that's basically this idea of tathata, suchness. 
Tathagata, of course, is a title for the Buddha. So this could be the meaning of Tathata, or the merit of the meaning of Tathata, the Tathagatas, Tathata, <laughs> something like that. Okay. And again, I want I want to remind you too that the titles are probably mini commentary. Now we get to the sutra. Okay. Thus have I heard. One time, the Buddha was residing in the Jetta Garden of Anathapindika's Park in the city of Shravasti, in the kingdom of Kosala. At that time, King Prasenajit and Queen Malika, who had only just recently attained faith in the Dharma, said these words together. Srimala, our daughter, is astute and extremely intelligent. If she has the opportunity to see the Buddha, she will certainly understand the Dharma, no doubt. Sometime we should send a message to her to awaken her uh, to awaken her mind. Let's put it that way. So yeah, I'm going to pause there. We got stuff to talk about already. So now we're introduced to who is this Queen Srimala? She's the daughter of King Prasenajit and Queen Malika. Who are King Prasenajit and Queen Malika, you may ask? Well, if if you've read a lot of Pali suttas, you will see King Prasenajit. He appears a lot. He's one of those royal patrons of the Buddha, along with Prince Jetta and King Ajatashatru and all these different royalties of India. King Prasenajit was also a supporter. It would seem that Sri Mala is the daughter of King Prasenajit. Now, if you read his, the Indian history, if you read the Pali Suttas, it does appear that King Prasenajit and Queen Malika had a daughter, but her name was not Sri Mala. And in ultimately, at least what most of these scholars think, I'm one of them as well, this is not a history. This is totally kind of made up in that way. Um, I think there's a lot of good reasons to think about, think of it that way. But that's who this character is, is that she is the daughter of these two famous royal patrons of the Buddha. Yep. And um, there's actually a story about how King Prasenajit met Malika. And it has to do with a mala, with a flower mala. And so there may be a tremendous amount of allegory already going on in this sutra that we don't really get in that way. So I just want you to know that, that these King Prasenajit and Queen Malika are historical, but this Queen Srimala most likely is not historical. She's most likely allegorical. Um, I don't want to rule out her historicity, but I'm not entirely sure it even matters in that sense. So, all right. And so you got the, um, the gist of the narrative. The narrative is King Prasenajit and Queen Malika have recently converted to Buddhism. And they're thinking, you know, our daughter, she's a sharp cookie. If she finds out about Dharma, she'll get it right away. Let's write her a letter. Oh, so the queen said, now is the right time. The king and the queen then wrote a letter to Sri Mala, praising the Tathagata's immeasurable punya. Praising the Tathagata's punya. Sound familiar? It's the title of the chapter. And then they dispatched, 
dispatched a messenger named Chandira to deliver the letter to the kingdom of Ayodhya, where Srimala was queen. Entering the palace, the messenger respectfully conferred the letter to Srimala, who rejoiced upon receiving it. Raising the letter to her head as a sign of reverence, she read and understood it. Arousing her mind, arousing a mind of rare quality. Then she said to Chandira, the messenger, in verse. And I'm going to pause there and then I'll read the poem. Okay. Questions, comments, answers, ideas? Yeah. Hey, Michael, what about the religious state of mind? Right? Okay. Okay. <laughs> so here we go. So that's a weird translation, a religious. So I, I, Eric, Eric caught me. So in the opening paragraph, King Percentagit says, sometime we should send a message to her to awaken her religious state of mind. And then later on down, it says that after she read the letter, it aroused a religious mind. What actually the words are is, so I've mentioned this many times before, but when these early Chinese translators were searching for words to match up with words like Dharma, words, uh, actually kind of words just like Dharma, um, they relied upon an existing vocabulary. In particular, there's a word which is Tao, like the Tao, like Taoism Tao. That's actually what it says is that they, they aroused her Tao mind, her Tao mind, her, her mind of the way. But I wanna remind you what I just said, which is that in the early days, before the Chinese had settled on and even actually after they settled on the character fa, so there's a Chinese character that's pronounced fa, that is the character for dharma. But they would often use the character for the way, the Tao, to represent dharma. And so you could, could read this probably closer to to awaken her dharma mind. That would be m probably much more accurate in that way. No matter how you slice it, though, to translate it as religious mind, there's nothing religious about the word Tao. It, again, it, it, if anything, it means a road or a path with the extension of a way or the way with the extension of the way of the universe, like the way everything operates. So it, it's not really... Uh, really great to translate it as religious state of mind. But what's actually most interesting about that sentence in the first paragraph where it says, sometime we should send a message to her to awaken her Dharma mind, to awaken her religious state of mind. The word awaken is, a, is also a, uh, a poor choice only because there's words that mean awaken. The word that's used here is this word fa to generate, to bring forth. And if you've been coming to the Dharma doors, I'd spend a long time one night talking about that one Chinese character, fa, because it's what you do when you generate the mind of enlightenment, when you generate bodhicitta, when you generate the vow to attain anuttara samyak sambodhi, the verb is fa or this chinese character fa and so what it says here is sometime we should send a message to her to generate her bodhicitta basically like that's what they're it's what it's saying like if if i'm doing a commentary then i'm gonna let everybody know that's what that refers to and it's pretty clear that that's what it refers to it's not 
Uh, it's it's not about her being religious. I would I would say that. All right. Good call, Eric. Thanks for calling me out on that. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, or answers, or ideas? Cool. So in all of my reading, uh, the all of the commentary, the the Wayman translation, the Diana Paul, in all of this, I was a little disappointed that nobody paid any attention to something very, very, very significant that happens in those first two paragraphs. And um, what, well, I'll just say it, and I've kind of, I drew it right here. It's so significant that in this sutra, it says, you know what, let's write her a letter to arouse her mind, her bodhicitta mind, in order to, what, is, uh, what does it say? Write her a letter praising the immeasurable merits of the Tathagata. What I mean is, is that if this sutra really does go back all like how far it goes back, but we know it goes back to the 400s, if not earlier, there's a very, very, very clear indication here that this is not an oral tradition, not even a little bit. They're telling you, we're gonna write a letter that's all about the Buddha, that's all about praising the Buddhas, and we're gonna use this letter as a conversion device to try to convince our daughter to convert to Buddhism, basically. Is this the letter that they wrote? If you get my meaning. Like, because they're, they're telling me that this is the, this is the chapter. Like, I, I'm not saying that there's a, that level of recursion going on here. But what I am getting at is, here is a record of the generation or, or, or the creation of Buddhist literature that's going to be used as an, as an upaya, basically, to try to get somebody. They're describing Buddhist literature happening. So that right away, I think, is really worth noting and paying attention to, that they didn't send a messenger who told her the Dharma. They wrote her a letter. She read the letter and saw the light, so to speak. In fact, you're in a minute, you're going to realize she literally saw the light. So, okay. So let's, <clears throat> so this poem is of Queen Srimala. This is, so she gets the letter from her parents. She reads it. She flips out, she, whoa, wow, right? She turns to Chandira. I can only imagine this person has an incredibly significant allegorical name as well. Turns to Chandira and says this. I hear the sound of the Buddha. Diana Paul translates it as I hear the name of the Buddha or I hear the name Buddha. But it's actually, I hear the sound Buddha is what the Chinese says. I hear the sound Buddha, the one who is rarely in the world. If these words are true, then I will honor him. Since I humbly submit that the Lord Buddha came for the sake of the world, he should be compassionate upon me and allow me to see him. All right, I'm just going to read it, but then I'm going to change it. At that very moment of reflection, the Buddha appeared in heaven, radiating pure light in all directions and revealing his incomparable body. Srimala and her attendants prostrated themselves reverently, reverentially at his feet and with pure minds praised the true punya of the Buddha. Okay, so I, 
already, and it's unfortunate too, because this is like really, really beautiful. So, so I'm gonna kind of say that again, the first uh, four stanzas of that. So I hear the sound of the Buddha, or I hear the sound Buddha. It's not really clear whether it's the sound Buddha or the sound of the Buddha, like the words of the Buddha, we're not really sure. But she says, I hear the sounds of the Buddha, the one rarely, the one who rarely comes into the world. I actually would translate this of not this idea of if my words are true, then I will honor him. I would actually translate this as, I hear the sounds of the Buddha, the one who rarely comes into the world, the speaker of truth. <laughs> the speaker of truth should be praised. I don't know why she, Diana Paul, thinks it's, it's Srimala saying about my words being true. It, it doesn't completely fit. So let's leave that one open to interpretation. But she's basically saying, like, I've read this letter about the Buddha, the one who rarely appears in the world. Um, and th that the, this truth should be praised. Or if these words are true, then the Buddha is to be praised, right? So then she says, um, I, I kind of prostrate myself or submit myself to the Buddha, the world honored one, um, the one who came, came for the sake of the world. Mm -hmm. Please, uh, it's kind of like, please have compassion towards me and allow me to see you or allow me to see the Buddha. Okay. So before I read the next part, which is really, really key, I want you to know that I was really happy. Uh, I chose this sutra for a bunch of other reasons. And then as I started reading it, I realized, oh, this is a perfect follow-up to the magician Bhadra. So the sutra that we just spent the last six weeks on, there's so many themes that get repeated here. And the first one is about this idea of seeing the Buddha. Because I want you to remember that that's what happened to Bhadra. Bhadra had this vision where he saw the Buddha everywhere. And that's what sort of initiated or generated his enlightenment mind. So the same thing is happening here where Queen Srimala is sort of basically saying like, wow, this is so great. This is beautiful. Like, I would like to see the Buddha. Like, I would praise the Buddha if I could see the Buddha, kind of an idea. And then what I'm most disappointed at in, and actually this is true of all the, both the English translations, actually all three of the English translations, because yeah, we do have three. This line that she has of, at that very moment of reflection, the Buddha appeared in heaven. Ah, oh, it's terrible, it hurts. It actually, it's so unfortunate because it's the most significant part of the, the poem. Because what it actually says is, it says, so then, it says then. Right, so I'm going to just read this character by character by character. So then, when she generated this sati, this constant, this mindfulness, this recollection, this awareness, when she generated or produced, Sheng brought forth this nian. Nian is this Chinese character for sati, mindfulness. So basically, when she produced or generated this particular mindfulness, it's, it says very clearly, the Buddha out of space appeared. Now you could gloss it, you could gloss it and say the Buddha appeared out of nowhere. 
you, you could really read the Chinese and, and, and it would be an accurate, true translation to say, the Buddha appeared out of nowhere. But it's helpful to know, of course, that the character Kong is this idea for either emptiness or space. In this case, I actually think they're referring to space, could go either way. But the idea here is, is that the Buddha's appearing out of nowhere. And if you want to get really technical, appearing out of shunya, shunyata, or akasha, and all of that is very, very, very significant. And before that, it says that in this state of mindfulness, the Buddha appeared out of nowhere. This, um, the Buddha appeared in heaven? I don't know where she got heaven from. There's no cause for heaven. So that's unfortunate. And then when she says at that very moment of reflection, like as if, you know, she were thinking it, like she's doing meditation, she's doing mindfulness, perhaps mindfulness on the letter that she got from her parents, right? So she's reading it, she's in mindfulness, and then the Buddha appears out of nowhere, radiating pure light in all directions, yes, and revealing his incomparable body. What I mean is, is that if you really think the Buddha appeared in heaven, then it's, you're off in some other thinking. <laughs> but if you are understanding that she's doing meditation on the Buddha, and having a vision of the Buddha out of nowhere, out of space, and it's radiating light. It's like, yeah, that, like Bhadra, like the same thing that happened to Bhadra in that way. So, so that's what happened. Um, yeah, and I've mentioned too, also Dharmador's past, that within the Mahayana tradition, there is this practice that's called Buddha Nashmurti, mindfulness of the Buddha. And it is a mindfulness practice that's very popular in the Mahayana tradition, not so much in the Hinayana traditions, but what it is, is where you use a statue, a painting, or even just a literal visualization, and you imagine the Buddha. And what they say is that if you do that well enough or long enough, you'll have a vision of the Buddha. And that's what happened to Queen Srimala. And when it did happen, Srimala and her attendants prostrated themselves reverently at the Buddha's feet and with pure minds praised the true punya of the Buddha. And then she says, the subtle body of the Tathagata, excellent in form, is unequaled in the world being incomparable and inconceivable. Therefore, we now honor you. The Tathagata's form is inexhaustible. Pranya wisdom is also like this. All things eternally abide in the Buddha. Therefore, we take refuge in you. Having already mastered the mind's defilements and the four kinds of body or the four kinds of faults in body and speech, you have already arrived at the undaunted stage. Therefore, we worship you, O Dharma Raja, Dharma King, by knowing all objects to be known and by the self mastery of your body of wisdom, you encompass all things. Therefore, we now honor you. We honor you, the one who transcends all measurement of space and time. We honor you, the one who is incomparable. We honor you, the one who has the limitless dharma. We honor you, the one beyond conceptualization. Please, be compassionate 
and protect me, causing the seeds of the Dharma to grow. In this life and in future lives, please, Buddha, always accept me. Then this vision of the Buddha replies, I have been waiting with you for a long time, guiding you in former lives. I now again accept you and will do likewise in the future. Sri Mala replies, I have produced merits at present and in past lives. Because of these virtuous deeds, I only wish to be accepted. Then Srimala and all of her attendants prostrated themselves before the Buddha's feet. And then the Buddha made this prediction among them. And that's going to have to wait until next week, because uh, that's the next section. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, I do want to just, because I have a few minutes, any questions, comments, and start answers or ideas about the poem? Tanya? Is there any significance that she talked about the Buddha's subtle body? It's what it's all about. I was, that's what I was going to comment on. Yep. So that whole poem is about the Buddha's subtle body. And it's, it's why I, I'm not crazy about this idea of the Buddha appearing in heaven or anything like that. In fact, if you understand that it's about appearing out of space or out of emptiness, you're going to be much closer to an understanding here. So let's, let's, let's touch upon a few other ones. Um, you encompass all things right? Um, all things eternally abide in you. It's another one. Um, the Buddha's subtle body, incomparable, inconceivable, beyond conceptualization, incomparable again, transcending all measurement. Those are some of the highlights. <laughs> so this sutra is very much about that Buddha, M meaning this Buddha whose body is incomparable, immeasurable, em encompassing all things. So this is very much again like the Bhadra Sutra from last week, where Bod that Sutra was not about Siddhartha, Gautama, the historical person. It was about this sort of Mahayana way of seeing the world. In other words, there's a deluded way of seeing the world. The deluded way of seeing the world is about, ooh, that's pretty, that's ugly, that's useful, that's not useful, that's good, that's bad. Duality, dividing the world up into all these different categories and then valuing other ones over other ones. That's sort of the ignorant, deluded way of seeing the world. If you can see all things equally in a way, then that would include the Buddha. <laughs> you, wouldn't, you wouldn't privilege the Buddha over this if you were really seeing all things as equal. In other words, if you were really on your upeksha game, if you were really deep in equanimity, then you couldn't even isolate the Buddha as separate from this or that. This or that would be the Buddha in that way. So, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, I'm simplifying, but that's the gist of this opening gatha, this opening poem. She, Sri Mala, is having a vision of the Buddha, a lot like Bhajra did, where she's seeing how the Buddha is everywhere, in everything. And I'm going to make a note right now to start with that idea next week. Done. And because that's the, the heart of this poem, or at least a deep aspect of this poem, 
I'll open with that next week and we'll get deeper into how is it that the Buddha's body is everywhere? How is it that this subtle body is incomparable, inconceivable, all of that? That's where we're going to start next week. So basically, we'll go back through the poem a little bit. And then we're going to hear about this uh, Vikravanya, or not Vikravanya, uh, Vyakaranya, this prediction of enlightenment. So stay tuned for the prediction of enlightenment next week. Once again, I appreciate everybody sitting through all the heavy scholastic stuff. If that isn't your cup of tea. Um, and otherwise, next week, we'll find out what happens. So, thanks, everybody.